Hey gang, we're back for our second of the videos. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the second um, story on the reading list, The Call of Cthulhu. Now, this is the one most people think of when they think of um, Howard Philip Lovecraft, when they think of H.P. Lovecraft. This is probably his most famous story. In fact, I'd go so far to say that there are people who have heard the term Cthulhu who probably have never heard, don't know who Lovecraft is to some extent. The um, A Call of Cthulhu is the definitive Lovecraftian weird story and, and uh, gave us, gave the world, gave popular culture, okay, uh, a sense that fiction, uh, and we're speaking of fantasy and horror and science fiction, okay, can speak to, has the opportunity to speak to a primordial history that, that our normal historical accounts, okay, uh, have no idea about. A history of not just hundreds of years, not just thousands of years, but hundreds of thousands of years, of millions of years, that the earth has been visited by the old ones, the deep ones, the outer ones, a long ago, long ago, uh, going back hundreds of thousands of years, even millions of years. This sense of a vast history, well, it's something that um, Lovecraft uh, may have encountered in H.P. Lovecraft. I'm sorry, in, I'm sorry, H.P. Blavatsky, B-L-A-V-A-T-S-K-Y. H.P. Blavatsky, who founded the Theosophical Society in the 19th century and wrote uh, this vast compendium called Isis Unveiled. And I know you've had a chance to actually look at that. Uh, I look at the Theosophical Quarterly, but you've actually looked at that book, and it's very fanciful to us. But H.P. Blavatsky claimed that that spiritual beings, beings who lived a long time ago, were communicating to her and telling her this primordial history story, the story of vast eons of time. Okay, that we, we would not otherwise have known about. And it's interesting that this story is so focused on mythology, because this story also spawned a mythology of itself. It spawned something known as the Cthulhu mythology, or the Cthulhu mythos. And that's because this is a story which is really popular at the time. It was a very popular story in Weird Tales, as we mentioned, where most of Lovecraft stories were published. And other writers um, began to notice it. And uh, and a lot of times Lovecraft would, would reach out to these other writers and would talk to them. And they formed something called the Lovecraft Circle. This was a circle of, of writers from weird tales that Lovecraft enjoyed, and he would reach out to them. And they began corresponding with each other. And they began doing something unique, something that, that I think is really, again, nowadays, it, it, it it's, not as, it's not as strange as it was at the time. But at the time, they thought, hey, let's share. Let's share these ideas. If you want to mention Cthulhu in your stories, that's great. And you know what? I'd love to mention this this character or this book or this or this 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 being that you mentioned in your story in my stories. And so you had all of these writers that were corresponding back to each uh, back and forth to each other, and they were starting to use each other's um, ideas. And it became again it was called the Lovecraft Circle at, at the time, and it spawned in something called the Cthulhu Mythos, the shared universe of beings. And a, and a kind of a modern mythology. They were creating a modern mythology of, of, of creatures and ideas, and they were um, all writing about it. Um, and people involved in the Lovecraft Circle were people like Robert Block, who wrote the, uh, the novel Psycho, which later became the Alfred Hitchcock movie. And people like Robert E. Howard, who was the creator of Conan the Barbarian. And of course, C.L. Moore, who's also on our list that we'll get to later on. And we'll talk more about the Lovecraft Circle then. But it's interesting, this idea of mythology that, occur that occurs all throughout the Call of Cthulhu, because it itself spawned a type of mythology, a literary mythology that's that's popular even to, to, to today. Okay. Um, we actually have three stories, three adventure stories, really. But 
what he does, what Lovecraft does, does here is, is classical Lovecraft. He gives us a disinterested narrator. This narrator is coming from outside the action. This narrator is not somebody who's directly involved in these adventures. This disinterested narrator is the executor of his granduncle's estate, his granduncle who was a college professor, an academic. Uh, he calls himself Francis Wayland Thurston, and these are the materials he has amassed. These materials are suggestive of what you call that mythology, okay, of a vast primordial history that t t modern science and contemporary history just have no conception of. And so um, the first the first story uh, that uh, we're addressing here is the story of H.A. Wilcox. Wilcox is a young man, a young artist, a sculptor, a very sensitive young man who has nightmare visions, dreams that inspire him to sculpt, sculpt this character who looks a lot like Cthulhu. Cthulhu is a priest figure. He is a priest for the old ones or the deep ones, the outer ones, this primordial race of beings who are hideous to look upon, but who once upon a time created a quote unquote cyclopean civilization on this on our on our planet millions of years ago, and it sank beneath the sea. Well, not unlike Atlantis, but now it has risen above the sea. And for a few weeks, for a few weeks, it causes sensitive people like H. A. Wilcox to have these dreams. And that's the first story, the first of the three stories that our narrator is sharing with us. And the second story, of course, is the tale of Inspector Lagrasse which is more of a mystery type story. It's more of a uh, a slowly uncovering of a conspiracy of some sort that then ties back to uh, the murder of the of the narrator's uncle um, to some some extent. The idea yeah, that the perhaps- story, The story, um, uh, the story occurs decades before the story with H.A. Wilcox decades before these visions that sensitive young people are reporting. And uh, uh, our narrator's grand uncle, okay, Professor Angel is his name. It looks like Angel, but Professor Angel has been collecting these accounts. But he becomes aware of the story of Inspector Lagrasse, who arrives at a conference a paleontologist and archaeologist and academics with a little statue that's a lot like what H. A. Wilcox sculpted, and it becomes a sensation at the conference. And uh, then the third story, the third story is the story of, of Gustav, a Norwegian Gustav Johansson, who leaves behind a written account of what happened when he and his fellow sailors encountered this island, this island that had suddenly risen above the waves, if only momentarily, and revealed the walls of this vast, again, the term is cyclopean, cyclopean civilization. It's vast. It's, it's, uh, operates according to rules of geometry that don't belong to our world. And what I think is interesting is how each of these stories is a little bit different. You have the, the um, um, and they're all, again, or, or the types of tales that you find in weird tales. The first one is sort of this um, weird little story of, 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 um, of something that was strange that happened to somebody else. The second one's sort of a, a, a mystery story. The third one's sort of an action adventure type story. And those were all popular at Weird Tales at the time. So it's kind of interesting that, that Lovecraft decided to take these slightly different types of stories and, and, and through them create an overarching tale. 
And remember, one of the questions we're trying to address that Brian Samuelson and I are trying to address in the weird course is the answer to this question. Why Lovecraft? And in particular, why this genre, the weird? Why is it that important authors today won't let us forget about weird tales, won't let us forget about this strange writer, H.P. Lovecraft? Why won't they let us forget about him and consign him to history? There are so many other weird writers, so many other writers published in weird tales whom we have forgotten. In fact, but, but for Ryan and I, you may never have heard of C.L. Moore, and we're going to be talking about her next. Okay, why is it that very important writers are not going to let us forget Lovecraft? I'm on page uh, 162, okay, of uh, The Call of Cthulhu, and it's the third adventure. This is where our disinterested narrator is summarizing, retelling the story that Gustav jo Johansson tells of encountering that island. He and his fellow sailors climb on this island, climb among these cyclopean walls and vaults, and they open, they unseal one of the vaults, and from it emerges unbelievably, okay, Cthulhu, a priest of the old ones. Okay, it's it boggles the imagination. And I'm reading again, uh, from the middle of page 162, okay, notice, notice the careful, the careful timeline on the part of our disinterested narrator who has amassed these materials. March 1st, our, okay, our February 28th, uh, according to the international dateline, the earthquake and storm have come from Dunedin. The alert and her crew had darted eagerly forth as if imperiously summoned, and on the other side of the earth, Poets, artists are dreaming of a strange, dank, cyclopean city, whilst a young sculptor had molded in his sleep the form of the dreaded Cthulhu. March 23rd, the crew of the Emma landed on an unknown island and uh, left six men dead. And on that date, the dreams of sensitive men assumed a heightened vividness and darkened with dread of a giant monster's malign pursuit whilst an architect had gone mad and a sculptor had lapsed suddenly into delirium and what of this storm of uh, what of this storm of april 2nd the date on which all the dreams of that city ceased and wilcox emerged unharmed from the bondage of a strange feature what of all this and of all those hints of old Castro about the sunken starborn old ones and their coming reign their faithful cult and their mastery of dreams was i tottering on the brink of cosmic horrors beyond man's power to bear that kind of extravagant language it's something inherited from edgar Allan poe and edgar Allan poe remains the great practitioner of that prose style in a sense However, in this paragraph, we're seeing something unique to Lovecraft, and we're seeing something unique to the weird. You spoke of a mythos or a mythology. Notice all these dynamics come together. We have a sensitive young man, a sculptor, who is haunted by dreams. We have a, a Norwegian crew landing on an island, okay, for brief amount of time for a few weeks that island is above the surface and it calls to people it calls to them to remember the old ones and then it sinks beneath the sea and suddenly the visions of sensitive young people cease and we're left to wonder who were these ancient ones these deep ones these old ones who were these people the starborn old ones are they someday going to reclaim our world what of their cult lurking between the lines of our society and what about and it's in italics 
their mastery of our imagination, their mastery of their dreams. Here we find unique properties of the weird. We find that Lovecraftian legacy that we're not allowed to forget, apparently. We're not allowed to consign Love Creek Love Creek, <laughs> Lovecraft to the dust heap of history, as so many weird writers have been. And I think that's a good place to stop it. And we'll see you guys with the next story. All right.